Uh, how many of you either read or saw C.S. Lewis's The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? You read it or you saw it? Okay. Okay. About half of you. Um, so The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe is a, is a fantasy children's novel written by C.S. Lewis. And uh, C.S. Lewis also wrote Near Christianity and is one of the premier 20th century Christian thinkers, most uh, very influential all around the world. Uh, but in this movie, Aslan, the lion, is a metaphor or you know, the embodiment of, of Christ. And what is happening in Narnia is that it's cursed. It was always winter, but never Christmas. Christmas never came in all 365 days out of the year. There was a curse across the land. And so Aslan wants to lift this curse. Edmund, one of the one of the kids that go through the armoire, no wardrobe. Sorry, wardrobe. not the armoire. <laughs> the wardrobe. Edmund is one of the kids that goes into Narnia through the wardrobe, but ultimately ends up betraying his friends, and ultimately Aslan dies sacrifices himself voluntarily for Edmund. However, it's not just <coughs> the death and sacrifice of Aslan was for Edmund. It wasn't just a substitution. That wasn't the breadth of the sacrifice. Beyond what happens, that is, in saving Edmund, the curse on the land is reversed. And Christmas comes. And death is defeated. And the white witch, who is basically the satanic figure, is defeated. <coughs> now, Aslan says in the book, the witch, the white witch, who is kind of the personification of Satan, should have known that when a willing victim who had committed no treachery, Jesus being perfect, was killed in a traitor's place for Edmund the boy. The table would crack, and death itself would start working backwards. Things were coming back to life. Winter was over, spring was here. Now, put that away, that story, and that the scope of Aslan's death, which is a metaphor for Christ and the crucifixion, put that away for a moment. We are gonna come back to that later in the sermon because today, part of what we're going to look at, the, the deepest part, where we're going to really go down below the river to the bedrock of the stream, is we're going to look at another layer of the meaning of the cross. Beyond Christ as a substitutionary atonement for our sins, another layer that you might not have considered that was the primary way the cross was understood for the first thousand years of the church. They're both equally fine understandings of the meaning and the power of the cross. But we'll come back now to Aslan. We're going to start in Colossians 2, verse 1. Paul says, I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and those in Laodicea. Remember, Laodicea is only about five miles away from Colossians, Colossae. And Paul's never been to either place. Epaphras, remember, has founded the church there in Colossae. And then he says, for all who have not met me personally, my goal is that they may be encouraged in heart, united in love. And what a wonderful show of unity this morning with all the volunteers helping with BBS. So that they may have the full riches of complete understanding. In order that they may know the mystery of God. And what is the mystery of God? Namely, Christ. In whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. What did Solomon pray for in the Old Testament? Wisdom. Pray for wisdom. Wisdom was thought of, both in, in certainly in Proverbs and in general in life, as true wealth, true riches. And Jesus then is a treasure chest of all the wisdom of the world. Paul again is building up to this heresy that's going on in Colossae where they are taking Christ and adding other things. 
mainly the worship of angels and other kinds of initiation rites. In the Roman world, there were things called the mystery religions. And so Paul is trying to let them know, when you open the treasure chest of all wisdom of the world, what do you find? Not all these other angels and whatever else you guys are into. It, it's all, all found in Christ. Christ plus nothing is everything, is Paul's message. I tell you this, Colossians, so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding <laughs> arguments. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, Christ Jesus, is that, was that his name? Is that his name? Was Christ his first name, Jesus his last name? No. His name was Jesus of Nazareth. Or in Hebrew, his name was? Yeshua. Yes. But even more Hebrew, Joshua. Oh, Joshua, yes. Joshua. After the, the, the earlier hero in the Old Testament. Joshua, Yeshua, and then, yes, Jesus. But his title was Christ, Jesus, the Lord. Christ meaning, in he, Christ is, in, in Hebrew is the word Messiah, which literally means smeared with oil, the anointed one. So the anointed one who is your Lord is Kyrios in Greek, just means master. And there was only one Lord in the Roman world, Caesar. This is why Christians are getting killed because they keep saying, Jesus is Lord. <laughs> Chop their head off. You don't do that. There's only one Lord if you're a good Roman citizen. And Christians were not good Roman citizens. They believed in another Lord. Christ Jesus as Lord. Continue to live your lives in Him. Rooted, built up in Him. Strengthened in the faith as you were taught. And overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy. Again, he's building up. He's building up to the problem here in Colossae. There's other philosophies at work. Not that philosophy itself is a negative thing, but you want to look out for those hollow and deceptive ones. The ones that don't lead you to Christ, that lead you to any other place besides Christ. Do not give in to those things. Because these hollow and deceptive philosophies, they depend on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world. What are the elemental spiritual forces of this world? Things that aren't Jesus, that much we know. So we don't want any of that. Probably demonic spiritual activity of some type. You want to stay away from that, um, rather than on Christ. For in Christ, again, last week we talked about this, this phrase. We don't talk about being in any other person. It's a very weird thing to say. I was in, and then put someone's name. But in Christ is the basic way in the New Testament we talk about someone who's a Christian. And maybe a good way to think about it is this. In Christ means to be incorporated into Christ. That is, you belong, and we all want to belong. Or to think about it even more corporately, we do say, say you, someone gets married, they do become and become a part, and now they are, we say, in the family. And that's what basically in Christ means. You are now in the family of God. That's a good thing, because everybody wants to be a part of some family. Being a part of the kingdom of God, that's a pretty good deal. For in Christ the fullness of the deity, that is God, for in Christ the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. In other words, Jesus wasn't half man, half God, 25% man, 75% God. In other words, again, same point. You don't need anything else besides Christ. Christ plus nothing equals everything. Get rid of this worship of angels, all this other weird stuff you guys are doing that you think you need, you don't need, it's leading you away from Christ. He's building up to this. Next week we'll get into the meat of, which is the last half of uh, Colossians 2. We'll get into some of the specifics. 
And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. Same point. You have all you need in Christ. You don't need any of this other stuff. He is the head over every power and authority. That's pretty simple. Pretty clear. Wasn't clear to them. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Pastor, what in the world does that mean? Now, we have to go back to the Old Testament. What was the initiation into being a religious Jew? The covenant that God made with uh, Abraham. That is, of course, circumcision. And so, uh, males circumcised themselves. I'll say the thing that they circumcised, but you know the thing that they circumcised. Because <laughs> I realize not everybody knows what it is, but I can't really say the thing in church, because you can't say that in church. But you know what it is, the private part, right? It gets sliced, the foreskin. Now, God could have said, you know, if it, or, you know, if, if it was up to us, Americans, as some kind of initiation uh, into... Uh, being a good Jew, we could have said, you know, you know, just wear the same T-shirt. Uh, you know, put a ring on your finger. Wear this necklace. God said, nope. I want things to be a little bit more personal. And you can think of circumcision as a very, very personal thing. Because uh, it is. And it kind of brings a smile to us, too, because it, it's also kind of weird. But it's very personal. Now, that's how you got initiated publicly into being a good Jew, a good Israelite, following Yahweh. In Him, in Christ, you were also circumcised. Pause. Recall that Paul says in Galatians that you don't need to be circumcised. Here he is saying you have been circumcised. Okay. Here he is talking metaphorically talking very much metaphorically, not in physicalness. Um, because the whole point is that Gentiles who wanted to be Christians, uh, Jewish Christians were telling them, hey, you got to do the thing. That's how we all became good Jews, and I know you're Gentiles, but now we're all Christians, and Jesus was a Jew, so you guys need to get circumcised. And Paul said, no, you don't. It's by faith alone. Right? So this is a metaphor. In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision not performed by hands. In other words, you have been initiated into Christ without physical circumcision, but metaphorical one. And here's what he, Paul's getting at, kind of a spiritual circumcision. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was, let's say, put off, cut off, when you were circumcised by Christ. In other words, not just your foreskin, but your whole sinful nature was sliced off from you when you were born again, when you became a Christian. He's just reaffirming and reassuring them, hey, you are in Christ. You have been incorporated. You are in the family. Verse 12, having been buried with him, again, incorporation, closeness, identification with Christ. Having been buried with him, metaphorically, we were not all there in the tomb, clearly. Right? You were not there in the tomb with him. Having been buried with him metaphorically in baptism, notice the connection between circumcision and baptism. Circumcision is kind of the public way uh, you get initiated into Judaism. Baptism is sort of your public way you get uh, initiated into Christianity. Now, do you have to get baptized in order to be saved? No. No. Thank you. No. I love the story that uh, Alistair Begg, Pastor Alistair Begg tells about this topic. I'll let me tell it quickly. Think of the thief on the cross, right? Jesus, two thieves on either side of him. One cursed him, one who said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Alistair Begg tells a theoretical story about that. That uh, thief on the cross who instantaneously then after he dies right next to Christ, wakes up and there's Peter and of course 
This is proverbial, right? There's nowhere in the Bible where it says Peter is the one who's going to meet you in heaven. But this is how we talk. It could be Jesus. But this story works better, I think, with Peter. Peter meets the thief on the cross. Says, what are you doing here? On what basis should we let you in? Now, did you go to church every Sunday? No, sir. Never went to church once in my life. Uh-huh. Now, now, of course, you read your Bible real good every day, like a good Christian. Sir, I've never read the Bible once. Peter gets agitated. And you think you're getting in? <laughs> what about Wednesday night? Do you go to church on Wednesday night? No, sir, never been. Never been to church. Uh-huh. Well, at least you went to maybe one prayer meeting at 6 a.m. at church on Saturday morning? No, sir, never been to a prayer meeting. Peter gets more and more agitated. <clears throat> on what basis do you think you're getting in here, bud? And the thief says, well, the man on the middle cross said I could come. And Peter said, welcome. Amen. It is by faith that we are saved. My recommendation is you don't wait till the last second of your life to put your faith in Christ like the thief on the cross. But it worked. So, you don't have to be baptized, but it is the public way that you get initiated into Christianity. Colt knows that well. He got baptized here a few months ago. <laughs> Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God. Baptism is metaphorically your old life and all your sins dead and come up out of the waters of baptism into newness of life, like Christ came out of that tomb three days later, who raised Christ from the dead. Verse 13, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. How? Through faith. He forgave us how many of our sins? You don't believe that. If you believe that Christ forgave all your sins, you wouldn't be up at night. You wouldn't be feeling guilty. I mean, do you really believe that? All your sins? Not that one sin that you've never told anybody about. You think God forgave you for that one? That's what it says. What about our future sins? Yeah, future sins. A lot of my college students when I was a college pastor could, couldn't get over that one. Well, then maybe we're going to go to the bar right after this meeting? <laughs> but Paul says in Romans 6, hey, don't increase your sin. Uh, he's, you know, says uh, well, grace will increase if we, if, we even, if we sin more, grace will increase. But don't do that. Don't do that. You've, you've died to sin. You've been buried through, uh, through baptism. Don't, don't do that. But yes, your future sins are also forgiven, which is pretty good news. Because I don't know about you, but probably, maybe, I might sin again before I die. Maybe. So that's going to be good that that will be forgiven as well. Verse 14. Two verses to go. Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, that is, that every human being has sinned, has, done, uh, has, has not been perfect other than Christ, and we were legally indebted to an infinite God. We might have committed finite crimes, finite sins, but we owe a debt to an infinite God who has infinite worth. Therefore, the only way that our, that our sins could be forgiven is through an infinite sacrifice. That would be Jesus. And so God cancels the charge of our legal indebtedness. We owe God, let's say, $50 billion for all our sins, canceled our debt. And if you recall our sermon a few weeks ago, Forgiveness literally means to cancel a debt, which stood against us 
and condemned us. Is it Romans 8, 1, 7, 1? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away. All our, everything that we owed to God, all, all the, the, the indebtedness that we owed, he has taken it away and done what? What does it say? Nailing it to the cross. Have you ever been a part of a, a church service where the, the cross is at the front and you come forward with the hammer and you, you write your sins and you put it on the, on the cross? Any of you done that? Just a few of you? Look at that. It's right there in the scripture. That that's what God did, essentially. Took all your sins, if you could write about all your sins, just took it, that I owe you, that we owe God, and put it on Christ, nailing on the cross, done, paid for. P-I-F, paid in full. Now, my paraphrase, some of you will recall I wrote a paraphrase of the entire book of Colossians in seminary, my paraphrase of this verse, to use a different image, your sins were scribbled on pieces of paper and nailed to the tree where Jesus died. Through Christ's death, God turned around his pencil and erased all the files containing the litany of wrongs that we had done throughout our lives. Verse 15, our last verse, where we're going to go deeper. And having disarmed the powers and authorities. Wait a this isn't about us now. Wait a second. This isn't about the exchange. This isn't about the substitution. This is about something different. The cross is about more than just dying in our place. And having disarmed, defanged the powers and authorities, spiritual forces, he made a what? A public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. A spectacle. <coughs> Now, Jesus, as he walked down the Via del Rosa, the road to the cross, was almost naked. Humiliated. Beaten. And then hung up on a cross. And this verse is saying, no. The powers all the spiritual forces of darkness in the universe were naked and lined up. And when Jesus was on the cross, he disarmed and took away all their authority, triumphing over them by the cross. We're going to dig down now into this verse. Triumph. This is actually a very specific word. You would not have known this, but it actually refers to a Roman victory parade. That was called a triumph. Jesus is living in the Roman Empire. When a general conquered Algeria or Spain, Egypt or Israel, Judea, if the general had captured enough slaves and had captured enough booty, that is treasure, the Senate in Rome would say, let's give this general a triumph, <coughs> an official victory parade. And in that victory parade behind the general would be all the slaves he's brought back from that land that it now belongs to Rome and all the treasure that they stole that now belongs to Rome. And if you go to Rome today, you know what you find all over the city? Lots of treasures from a lot of other places. Especially a lot of obelisks from Egypt that they conquered. So this verse is saying that Jesus made all the powers in the universe, just think of the bunch of thousands of demons all lined up, and Jesus is leading them in a victory parade and they're the ones who are captive, even though it looks like Jesus is the one who's losing. It's all going to work towards Jesus' advantage. Some examples. Here's the message version. By the way, 
I've never told you this, but in general, when I'm reading scripture like this, I'm reading from the NIV. Sometimes it's the NASB or the ESV. But, let me read this one more time. This is the NIV. Then we'll go to the message. The message, Eugene Peterson, paraphrase, right, of scripture. But sometimes it's really good. We're going to get to that. So having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over by the cross. Here's the message version. He stripped, Christ stripped naked all the spiritual tyrants in the universe of their sham authority at the cross and marched them naked through the streets. Amen. Is that pretty vivid? Yeah. Is that pretty vivid? Yeah. He stripped all the spiritual tyrants, all the demons in the universe, Satan, all his cohorts, of their sham authority at the cross, marched them naked through the streets, even though it was Christ who was marching naked through the streets. Okay? Bible background commentary on this verse says, in Rome, um, in Roman triumphs, in, in Roman victory parades, the general, who's coming back from defeating Spain or wherever he was, he dresses up as, as the chief god Jupiter. Jupiter is the main god of the Romans, like Zeus was the main god of the Greeks. And he would lead behind him, as I mentioned, humiliated captives, stripped of their possessions. Indeed, the general would put on not just his general clothes, he would also rub his face so that it looked red, like Jupiter. So this is what's going on in this verse, is Jesus is leading his own type of parade. And the cross is not just about a substitution for us. It's about a cosmic battle against the devil. The much bigger idea of the meaning of the cross. This is, if you ever go to Rome, this is one of the things you'll see. This is one of the worst things you'll see as a Christian, because what this is, is Titus, the general, in 70 AD did what? Destroyed the temple, destroyed the temple in, in, in Jerusalem and has not been rebuilt to this day. And so when they came back to Rome, what did they carry? A menorah from the temple in Jerusalem. So this is a commemoration of a Roman triumph, a Roman victory parade, with a bunch of Jewish slaves carrying their own menorah and giving it to the Romans because they've been conquered. Again, as a Christian, you're like, uh. But to give you an idea. Um, now, <clears throat> in 2 Corinthians 2.14, another Pauline, uh, passage, he uses this idea of, of the triumph of the victory parade again, in a different way. But thanks be to God who always leads us as captives in Christ, us Christians as slaves of Christ, behind Jesus, Jesus leading the parade in this case, who always leads us as captives in, tri in Christ's triumphal procession, and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. Translation, us Christians should smell real nice to the rest of the world. And they'll get in line in the victory parade. So, what happens on the cross according to Colossians 2.15? Not only does Christ die for us and nail our sins to the tree, he is our substitute, that's true. But, in addition to it, demons are disarmed and defeated. Right? The powers, the authorities are, literally, the word is disarmed made naked, stripped of their power. So, in the 90s, there was a song by a Christian music artist, by Carmen, and the song was called The Champion. Does anybody remember this song? Okay, a few of you. I was, I was like, man, I was like, no one raised their hand, I was like, this is going to be so dated, so dated. Okay, but in that song, it was very, very popular. I thought about playing it for you, and I thought it's eight minutes long. It's not, it's not gonna work. But the point of this song is that Jesus and the devil get in a boxing ring together, and that the cross is sort of um, is like this. Jesus gets punched out and goes down for the count, and in a boxing ring, you count one, two, three, up to ten, and the, and the fight's over. But in the song. Jesus goes down, right? He's crucified, he's dead. And God the Father is the, the referee. And instead of counting from 1 to 10, he starts at 10, 9, 
they almost like something good's about to happen, and Satan in the song is, oh, God, you can't do this. This is backwards. Three, two, one. Of course, Jesus gets back up. He's alive. He's alive and unforgiven. But the point is, the cross in the song is a cosmic battle of Jesus versus the devil, not just as a substitute for our sins. The cross has meaning that's another layer that you might not be used to thinking about. Now, Colossians 2.15, the one we've been talking about. Some of your heads are exploding. I can see that. <laughs> Three more minutes. This idea that Christ disarmed the powers, the demons, that the cross is a cosmic battle, that Jesus is defeating death and the devil on the cross, is known as, and there's not going to be a test, but you should know there's a name for it. It's called the Christus Victor Theory of the Atonement. The idea of the cross as a divine conflict and victory Christ fights against and triumphs over the evil powers of the world. And in him God reconciles the world to himself. Amen. I'll close with this. There's a song, an uh, Easter song by Matt Maher. I love this line in it because it has this idea of the cross behind it. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling over death <laughs> by death. How does Christ strike death a deadly blow? By dying himself. And so Paul is getting at that Christ's, the meaning of the cross, deals a deadly blow against the devil, and the curse is reversed. your heads are exploding, and we'll close it. <laughs> so let's pray. Lord, we give you thanks for your word. We give you thanks that the cross, Lord, has meaning even beyond perhaps what we might have thought, that it has layers and layers of power. Lord, that on that cross, not only were our sins forgiven, but the devil was disarmed and defeated, that death itself died that all the demons were metaphorically behind Christ in a victory parade where the cross defanged and disabled evil. And ultimately, Lord, none of them can harm your believers because all our sins are forgiven. There was only resurrection and eternal life waiting for all who put their faith in you. Lord, we give you thanks for this truth this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.